Oh my gosh, guys, congratulations. What a poignant and powerful series. I watched the first four episodes and was completely blown away. So congrats, congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Quinn, when we had the pleasure of speaking a few years back, you beautifully said that having a lack of judgment for your characters is something that you do, that you love to do in your art. Um, a quality that, in my opinion, is essential to great storytelling and something that you and Rebecca Godfrey shared when bringing the story to life, putting humanity and honesty first. Can you talk to me about crafting this series from a place of humanity above all else? I mean, yeah, you put it beautifully. It was what drew me the most to Rebecca's work when I read the book. Um I, you know, this this is such a tricky story, and I think it was so important to hold sort of both truths while working on it. Like the fact that this crime was something that no one could ever take back and that there was no excusing what had happened, but also that the people involved in the crime were such young children and that at least in my opinion, you don't really stop violence or stop things like this from happening, stop bullying, you know, all of sort of the nuance that went into this crime without truly understanding how something like this comes to be. And I think that we both saw the opportunity to tell like a deeply human ensemble story where we do give, you know, every single character space to be understood by the audience and kind of allow the audience to form their final opinions. I think doing that without judgment, it was essential. Absolutely. I mean, I was thinking a lot about my experience as a teenager in like the early aughts when cruelty was sort of a source of power um, and even, you know, need it for survival sometimes, which is like heartbreaking to reflect on. Um, and like the physical and emotional violence that are that this patriarchal society, you know, that has forced young girls to to navigate that. Um and it's caused so much generational harm. I mean, can you both talk about collaborating with each other and this, oh my gosh, this talented group of young women that you have on this series <laughs> to kind of bring the complexities of that cruelty to life? Yeah, I mean, I think what you just said is is so relevant that it cruelty as a means for survival, I think is well put because suddenly when you put it that way, you suddenly have a certain empathy for that cruelty, which seems counterintuitive. But in order to understand where it's coming from, uh, you do actually have to extend a little bit of grace to the person being cruel. Um, it's the only, like, we can all wish it away as long as we want, but the only way to really get to the end is to actually take that extra step that sometimes is hard. Um, and I think that became... Kind of a running theme of the show and our non-judgment of the characters also at some point becomes text within the show where the characters are speaking about how we shouldn't judge various characters within the show um and then of course very naturally there's a response to that which says like well why why wouldn't i judge this person for doing one of the worst things i've ever witnessed um and these become very difficult conversations that we were having kind of off screen that we put on screen and we needed to bring everybody involved uh, who had to portray these characters into that conversation, both outside and inside the actual show itself. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Quinn, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. I mean, I think I would just, I would say that, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned like patriarchal violence, because I think that the girls in this particular story were almost performing a form of cruelty, bravado, and violence that was really associated with men. You know, these were people, you know, the, the girls, you know, there was a gang that called themselves the Crip Mafia Cartel. You know, it was this idea of, of what they saw on the television of violence. You know, Josephine Bell wanted to be John Gotti. That was her idol. And I think that, you know, of course, for us, it's about peeling back the layers of, you know, how does a 14-year-old girl who's in the foster system end up wanting to be known as, you know, that she's just like John Gotti, that comes from somewhere. That's a, clearly a form of self-protection. And then, you know, with, with Rena, there was a certain desire to be as, maybe like as, um, 
have as much bravado and as, mu as much toughness as these girls that she idolized. His yeah. idea that it's constantly trying to be less emotional, less sensitive, something that's really associated with being a girl. And I think, you know, in the show, that's where that empathy comes mm -hmm. from, is us seeing that really human part of them that they're fighting. Yeah, it's truly heartbreaking. Um, also, I want to say that well, well, let's talk about how important it was for both of you to honor Rena's life in full and and not to exploit or sensationalize her death, which unfortunately we've seen before countless times in the genre. Um, and I just thought it was so beautifully done and respectfully done. Um, can you both talk about that? Yeah, that was very important to us to not make a story that starts with her body being found and it's only about the characters grappling with that and she really just becomes a plot device at that point um it was the least interesting aspect of the story to us actually we were much more fascinated with who the human being that rena was um was and to yeah dig into her home life it's something that the the media didn't really cover because they they weren't able to they just didn't have that access um and we in particular yeah also didn't you know we have one poem that Rena wrote. It's kind of the only window into her soul. So we had to do a lot of work, just having conversations with each other, with our writer's room, trying to understand what her life may have been like. Um, and that also illustrates like the soul that was lost. Like without really seeing her in life, we don't really feel the impact of what was taken away. Mm -hmm. I know I, I said, I think the guiding force for us in the writer's room was, you know, there's a, there's a, second timeline in the show that's Rena before her death. And I, I think I always said, you know, if we're doing our jobs right, we won't remember that she dies when we're with her in scenes. And I think that was very important to us. And also that her scenes have joy and be funny and and be tender in the way that like being a teenager is like she's rebelling and 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 having all these experiences. And I think that really puts into perspective when the timelines meet, like what how much was lost. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, well, I just was told to please wrap up. I could talk to y'all for hours. Thank you so much, Clint. Thank it was you. so good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah.